we gave uh, Reggie a brief introduction before, but Reggie Anderson is a professor in, uh, in neurobiology. Which department are you in? He works, he works across multiple departments. He's in neurosurgery. Um, he's, he's Bio, bioengineering. Bioengineering. And yeah, I mean, biology. Yeah, and see, physiology. there's a lot. There's a lot, there's a lot of departments. <laughs> uh, but uh, Reggie's really, he's been in this field. Uh, not, to, not to date him or age him, but he taught me when I was an undergrad here at UCLA. So um, he doesn't remember that. But <laughs> So he's been at this a while. So thank you very much. Well, the fact that I'm in so many different departments, uh, that <clears throat> is telling a story in itself, is that maybe we shouldn't be in these departments. Maybe we, we should be <laughs> not have these uh, boundaries. Uh, so um, I'm going to um, approach this uh, presentation from the standpoint of uh, new scientists, clinicians coming into the area. Uh, and talking about the, a training grant, I think we really need a training grant in this this area to help uh, cross the uh, the borders, and so uh, just think about that of what I'm saying relative to how we're going to prepare the new generation for uh, what is to come. And I will say that in in, in spite of uh, the the um, reservations, I think there's always been reservations, and they re there always will be. Uh, but when we say reality, we need to think, especially uh, when, if you're just getting into the area, you need to think of what is reality today is not necessarily reality for the future. So that's another way of looking at it. Now, <clears throat> I would say we have, have uh, and, and colleagues, have found a number of, uh, uh, have made a number of observations which have been rather surprising. And uh, the levels of recovery uh, were ones that would not have been uh, predicted uh, based on uh, the, the present dogma. And interestingly, I think one of the reasons that we've seen these things is that we, we've actually exposed a new physiology that's related to the control of movement and the control uh, within the autonomic system. And so this has occurred uh, with old technology, we started uh, this uh, neuromodulation of the spinal cord with trying to get individuals to stand in the step. Uh, we uh, did that with the old technology that's decades old that was used for pain. Uh, so we're in a state now that I think we need to keep, we need to get the technology updated uh, to uh, what we think is possible for the, for the future. Uh, and uh, one of the ways that we can help to make that happen is to have a successful uh, training grant here and at other places. So what I'm going to do <clears throat> is talk just a little bit about what, how we think the neuromodulation is working, why it's working, and how it's taking advantage of a new physiology which uh, we had not uh, appreciated uh, before. And, uh, <clears throat> and then I'm going to go over uh, several outcomes from this neuromodulation so you can get an idea of the potential impact of neuromodulation if you use it in, in very specific ways. Uh, so, um, that's, so I don't want to try to convince you that each of these observations is, uh, uh, you don't even have to believe them, but I'm just going to show you what the observations are and then uh, uh, time will tell how effective and, and how acceptable uh, they are. Another uh, point that I would like to make in all these experiments when we started working with human subjects is we decided uh, that the correct way to do this or the most effective way to, to do these studies is to study extensively and qu very quant quantitatively just a few subjects rather than studying hundreds and getting relatively superficial information and giving you no idea of what is the biology behind it. So uh, we, we are pretty convinced that the way to really find new things in this area, you, you need to, to focus on, uh, on the details of a subject and, and get to know what the, the subject is really going through during those treatments. And then finally, I'm going to give you an example of 
why we think it's important for technology and, and biology to be working very closely together, basically as a single unit sharing ideas. I'll, I'll, the example is, 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 is very clear. So uh, we have, we're trying to develop technologies and it's going very slowly. Now when we basically got started at, in 2008, with, we had applied to NIH to, uh, to implant the pain uh, uh, epidural stimulator uh, from Medtronics uh, to see if we could uh, at least get to the proof of principle, can we take advantage of this automoticity and smartness within the circuitry of the spinal cord. So this is what the general thinking was in 2008. And then in, I'll show you this slide and how I think it's changed, but the, I think the perception, I'm, I'm not saying that everybody is going to believe this, but from my perspective, uh, this, this was the perception, uh, and, uh, but a lot of those concepts, I think we have to throw away and, and think of a, a new possibility. So, uh, for example, the idea that Dan was talking about the idea that recovery is not going to occur after six months. Well, all of the subjects that we've studied basically has been more been injured for more than a year, and some of them up for up to twenty years. So one of the key experiments uh, has been was this one, and this does not even include modulation. But this shows an animal that was completely spinalized, could not step at all, had been spinalized for three months. We put it on the treadmill after we gave it strychnine, and the strychnine facilitated the circuitry by disinhibiting. It's a glycine receptor. And, uh, and this animal, 30, 30 minutes after we injected IP, uh, this animal could walk full weight bearing over a range of speeds. So that tells us that, that tells it, and th that's no input from the brain, and the spinal cord is walking like this. So this goes back to the basic concept from the beginning, when we started doing the animal studies, is how much of the automoticity that's built into the spinal circuitry can we take advantage of after complete paralysis or severe paralysis. So uh, this uh, was telling us a lot. In fact, it was telling us more than we were even realizing. We say, well, this is great, but we keep understanding the significance of that. Now, uh, combining with technology, after a, n a number of years, and we had working with epidural stimulation, and the other is the transcutaneous non-invasive stimulation, like Dan was talking about. And this is an example of a person that has complete paralysis, uh, the fact that he's blind is just a side of, of interest, uh, but he's been, he walks thousands of steps in this exoskeleton. And, and what we're hoping with this type of exoskeleton, it will tell you how much work the subject is doing and how much work the robot is doing. So it will do all of the work if we, if we let it. So the question is, with neuromodulation and training, can we... Uh, can, can we uh, get the person to learn to step so that be they become more independent of the, of the robotics? And uh, after five sessions, now we'd already seen, this is with transcutaneous, non-invasive stimulation. We started stimulating him and after five days we tested him similar to what we had with the epidural implanted subjects who regained voluntary control uh, again, in chronic, complete uh, uh, paralysis, uh, each of the four subjects, first four subjects that we studied, regained voluntary control and, and, and movement similar to what you see here. Now, after five sessions, and this is, I think, approximately three years after the injury, has a very complex, relatively low thoracic injury, and we turned the stimulator he, he, we ask him to move, and he can't move his legs. Turn the stimulator on, and he doesn't move. This is a key point. In fact, it's related to what Bruce was just talking about. Stimulator on does nothing. We are neuromodulating the circuitry. We're not inducing a movement. We're enabling the movement. We're in, and so he tells him to 
flex his knee, and this is, he flexes his knee. This is the first time he had done it since he had been completely paralyzed. And this is voluntary. So uh, these are the type of findings that makes us think that there's things here to take advantage of. Again, what we're basically testing is what can happen. We're not testing what does happen in a large population. So we're finding out what can happen, and then we can take it from there as to whether it's going to be practical and so forth. Now, what's the mechanism? I'll give you just a short idea, but the first experiment we did with the first subject with epidural implant, this is exactly what we observed. And this observation shows that <laughs> as we increase the voltage, got no force until we got to about seven volts. And at seven volts, the subject says, I feel connected. And <laughs> I don't know, I don't know anybody that knows what that meant, but he could generate a little bit of force, and as we increase the voltage, more force. And basically what we are doing, I think, is increasing the excitability of the, of the networks um, that are generating this type of, of um, a movement. And uh, now, uh, Dan showed you this, and for, from the beginning we thought, well, this kind of fits this pattern. That is, uh, you've got to reach this motor threshold, uh, and then you can move as you wish. But after the injury, we don't know how much activity automoticity is remaining. Uh, and maybe it, you're completely paralyzed until you get to this point here. So with, with the uh, enabling motor control, the electrical stimulation, if we put that, combine that with this, we can get above the motor threshold. Now, what's the nature of this connect connectivity? Uh, we don't know. I have no idea what the anatomical basis of it is, but we know for certain that there's physiological, there's functional connections that are formed very rapidly. And in fact, in some of the subject, subjects with neuromodulation transcutaneously, some of the subjects showed some voluntary influence within one session. So that tells us one thing, that this lesion that we call complete paralysis it needs to be re-examined, and we have no idea what the real biology is behind that. And I'll give you a little bit of a physiology here. Uh, <clears throat> this is, I want you to look at, I'll skip some steps here. So ordinarily we would say the resting excitability is say this level, this is the motor threshold. You've got to get to this motor threshold to get movement. And the more effort, you'll recruit more motor units and get more force. But we think after injury that that resting level goes significantly down. There's a lot of loss of synaptic contact to these motor neurons down here. So, uh, so we think that with the stimulation, we can bring it back up, and then that enables uh, the person to move. Now, this what happens the one, the major point that I want to make here, ooh, uh, two minutes left. The major point that I want to make is, is that this physiology below the motor threshold is extremely important and we've generally, it's been ignored in electrophysiological experiments. Uh, so uh, this is an example of, um, of individuals with complete paralysis and I'm going to move this on up. This is what we call zero-g uh, gravity or uh, situation. We ask them if they can um, move uh, voluntarily. They've been had 18 sessions of treatment here. That, again, complete paralysis. And then we turn the stimulator on. We ask them to voluntarily move. And... Um, and then you add the stimulation to it. And this is the type of movement that you can see. So uh, the bottom line is there's a lot of potential uh, in, the, in the spinal cord that we have not known about. And uh, this, is, this shows the, uh, the force, the, the uh, knee angles that have changed uh, with, um, 
with just voluntary effort and this voluntary plus stimulation. But a key point here is some of these individuals were able to move their limbs as well without stimulation as they were with stimulation. The point there is there is a plasticity that's occurring so that they become more independent of the stimulation. Will they ever become fully in independent? That remains to be determined, and I would guess uh, probably, uh, probably not. Uh, and so with hand movement, you've already seen that, and uh, the type of improvement that can occur there, this is with eight, eight treatment sessions, non-invasive stimulation over four weeks, two times a week, and this is their improvement in grip force. So with and without stimulation. So the, the, uh, with, uh, the difference between before, without stimulation, and what they could do with stimulation at the end was over a 300% increase. And we have measures of, uh, uh, that's related to quality of life and what they could do with their hands and so forth uh, that is consistent with this is really functional movement. One individual has gone from not being able to feed themselves to feeding themselves, and I would say that has some impact on quality of life. Now, this is the example that I wanted to show you uh, that has to show you why physiology and technology needs to be working together. This is the trained mice to step with a fixed trajectory versus not a fixed trajectory, but one that allows variability. This is uh, untrained rats, spinalized, and you see the variability. If you train them, you see this, but even when they're trained, you see a lot of variability. The point is the basic biology of movement has the intrinsic, the intrinsic properties of this control is that there's got to be variation. There is significant variation. And so when we train them with fixed versus no variation, uh, that uh, they step much better. So this is an example. The basic concept here is that if the spinal cord has decided the foot is going to be here versus here, the, the robot has already decided it's got to be here. So it's in a constant mood, mo uh, mode of correction. And therefore, uh, what happens is that the recip reciprocity of flexors and extensors is totally uh, disrupted. And so the, the spinal cord is being corrected constantly, so it can't learn what it's supposed to be doing. So there's a, one of the most uh, successful robots on the market for stepping has a fixed trajectory. And that device serves as a coat hanger uh, in many laboratories today because it does, is not taking advantage of a basic property of physiology. Uh, so using neuromodulation, we enable, we don't induce those experiments that Bruce was talking about. They're implanted electrodes in the muscle. The muscle is not that smart. The smartness is in the spinal cord. So we enable the spinal cord. We take advantage of the control. So if you're di directly stimulating the muscle, the movement will be only that of which muscles you're stimulating. But if you're neuromodulating and you've got the brain involved, then you've got your full range of movement that you can perform. You're not limited. So uh, this uh, is going back to Assuming dominance of the cortical control, I think we uh, know that that's uh, not so great. Uh, it was not as great as what has been thought. Is it important? Yes, it's important. Can we do a lot without it? Yes. The magnitude of the automaticity, we're still uh, impressed with how much that, that's the point. Proprioception, you saw that cat stepping. That was control only coming from proprioception and cutaneous information and uh, not realizing the role of activity-dependent plasticity, this is critical to the whole thing. You can activate the circuitry, but if you don't tell the circuitry what to do, it doesn't know how to adapt. It has to be given uh, useful information, uh, functional information to tell it how to adapt. So that's why it's so important. And the dogma that nothing can happen after a year, that's based on results that we've seen, that's ridiculous. <coughs> Uh, and we have to admit we don't know what that lesion is for complete paralysis. We don't have a clue. 
what we have been assuming it is, is not correct. So I would say there's tremendous potential for the future. This is just the beginning. So if I were a, 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 a new young postdoc uh, that was interested in this area, I would say there's tremendous potential. Tremendous potential if, if we're able to combine the technology with the physiology. And so there's many people that's been imported here. Yuri Jarazimiko, Parag Gad, uh, Joel Burdick from Caltech. Uh, you'll hear from this guy later on, and, and some of our Russian colleagues where we've collected a lot of data also. So, uh, and there's uh, other colleagues uh, that have contributed. Uh, the work that Dan was talking about, we've been working together for about five years on that grant. And uh, Lisa Moore has been one of the key uh, uh, players in, in that. And this is Susan Harkema, who we did the work with uh, at University of Louisville with, with the first four subjects uh, and, and her assistance. And we've gotten some assistance, but never enough. Thank you. Great talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, in your talk and Dan, so you're talking about uh, in invasive and non-invasive techniques. And in the implanted ones, um, in those patients, were they not able to have restoration with neuromodulation that was external? Uh, did, was that tried before the spinal cord implant? The, the, uh, the non-invasive started after. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the non-invasive uh, technique started after, but not long after. Uh, and uh, we're uh, in, in the grant with uh, Dan and I, we're, we're testing both, both techniques. Uh, we're always asked which one's better, and we don't know. Uh, I think we, we, we need both of them, I think, to see how it works out. Great. Thank you very much, Reggie.